23 times. It's as if the guy is learning a craft that he loves and he gets better at it every day. This looks like the Ripper's early work to end. By the time he gets to Mary Kelly, this guy's at the apex of his game. He has Mary Kelly in a locked room. He kills her. He totally destroys her. Whatever motivates him, as sick as it sounds, it's clear that he enjoyed himself fully at this point and spent a long time with the body. For him, this is the pinnacle of his killing career. A few days after the last victim is killed, the police go to James Kelly's old address, where he murdered his wife. But he's not there. There's no follow-up. The police are overwhelmed by the Ripper crisis, and the case against Kelly goes cold. I have seen this literally hundreds of times. You have to be relentless in your pursuit. You have to go to many locations. You just don't go to his last address and give up. If I had heard about James Kelly as a suspect during the Jack the Ripper case, there wouldn't have been a door on the hinges in London. I would have been to every address he could have possibly been at. Everybody who might have known his whereabouts would have been arrested or at least questioned, and, and questioned thoroughly about where he could have been. No stone would have gone unturned for this guy. I don't know why it didn't happen, frankly. Kelly disappears, but his confession tells us very clearly where he went. America. Case detective Ed Norris is searching for history's greatest serial killer, Jack the Ripper. His chief suspect is James Kelly, a psychotic wife killer on the run from a lunatic asylum. Ed's tracked Kelly to London and put him in the frame for the Ripper killings. I feel good about Kelly right now. He could be the guy. Ed has uncovered two bloody murders in New York matching the Ripper's gruesome M.O. There's a cycle on the loose, but could it be Kelly? If I can put him in New York City at the time of the Carrie Brown murder, I'd be very excited. Kelly's confession already places him in the United States. He gives an account of where he was, and where he was was all over the place. He comes to America many times, not just once. It's a great piece of evidence. Kelly's in America, but Ed needs to tie him to the murder of the New York prostitutes. How can Ed track his suspect 120 years after the crime? At Britain's National Maritime Museum, they keep a record of every ship to have crossed the Atlantic in the 19th century, including the one Kelly took to the USA. He actually tells you in the letter that he leaves aboard a ship called the Zandam from Rotterdam to New York City. In my experience, criminals make things up sometimes. I want to see if there's any truth to this. Does a ship actually exist and would it have sailed uh, around that time and is it possible? Kelly's in the right city. But the key to this case is timing. If I, in fact, find that Zandam arrived in New York City in time for the murder of Carrie Brown, it makes me feel a lot better about Kelly and as a likely suspect for the Carrie Brown murder. The Ripper's last appearance in London was November 1888. Carrie Brown was killed in New York April of 1891. Zandam, there we go. All right. Zandam, Rotterdam. There it is. Got it. Tells me the Zandam went from Rotterdam to New York in time for the Carrie Brown murder. Apparently arrived about October 7th, 1890. So, again, a couple months right before. So, perfect. Kelly's ship was just one carrying thousands of people from London every week. But Kelly has problems. He's a known killer on the run. How does a wanted man get into New York? Back in the 1890s, before the establishment of Ellis Island, coming in and out of the city was a lot easier, much less bureaucratic. Professor Dan Citrum has examined 19th century immigration and the loopholes that could allow a killer into the country. 
before passports, before driver's licenses, photo IDs of all kind, people could come and go in a much more easy fashion. You could literally, you could totally start your life over. That's right, and that was the attraction of a place like New York for an awful lot of people who were trying to remake themselves, trying to escape a crime or whatever it might be. To help him blend into the crowd, Kelly changes his name to John Miller, one of the most common names among immigrants in America. He becomes one of thousands of John Millers. It's like a disguise. The guy clearly knows what he's doing because it's a classic trick for people on the run. And then he can disappear in New York. He's able to get work. There's an upholstery trade there, so he's got money. And best of all, it's full of prostitutes. So he can continue doing what he was doing in London. In New York, without the cops breathing down his neck, James Kelly, alias John Miller, alias Jack the Ripper, could dive back into his work. And knowing Kelly's history, Ed now discovers a new pattern to the killings. One that may explain the X that was carved into New York prostitute Carrie Brown. What if the X wasn't a letter, but a number? The X could be significant because if you accept there are five victims, we all accept that. If you put in the other three that are widely accepted beyond the five, that's eight. You include his wife, that's number nine. Carrie Brown could be number ten, and the X could signify the Roman numeral ten, his tenth victim. With ten deaths on the books, the case against Kelly gets more pressing. But before Ed can finally nail his suspect, he needs eyewitness corroboration. Eighty years after his death, James Kelly is about to face a criminal lineup. In the hunt for Jack the Ripper, Ed Norris is closing in on his prime suspect. James Kelly, a psychotic wife killer who escaped from a lunatic asylum and spent 40 years on the run. From deep in a century-old archive, Ed has found a surviving picture of his target. Now, Ed plans to use a modern forensic technique to see what secrets the old photo can reveal. So we're going to take that photo of him at 67 and see if it's possible to de-age the photo. They've used this in the past the other way. I've taken photos of, of children and tried to age them into adults if they're missing. I've taken suspects who are on the run as young men to try to age them to what they look like now. I've never used it in the reverse. I want to see if it's possible. Steve Mancusi was the NYPD's senior forensic artist for nearly 30 years, helping to crack some of its most difficult cases. Now he's going to remove 40 years from James Kelly's photo. As you get older, all that, all that gravity sets in and, you know, your face starts to droop. You clean them up a little bit, give them more of a younger, brighter look. We're toning his body down a little bit, starting to darken up his hair. I've never seen it done in reverse. His eyes were an issue early on, so we give him a little bit younger, brighter expression. Forensic art really brings a very interesting part to an investigation. A lot of times it will pull the proverbial rabbit out of the hat and you have nothing it gives you something. In 1888, there was a certain style to the hair and to the mustache. And there he is as a younger man. Ed's next step, put Kelly's face next to the Ripper's. Steve Mancusi pulls up the best image we have of Jack the Ripper. 19th century witness statements had enough detail to produce a modern sketch. It shows a man in his early 30s with a mustache and hat. He seemed to be wearing one of these felt hats. Yeah. That's how the witness saw him. So let's take Kelly and put a similar hat on him so we get the sense of, of how he may, he may have looked. Jack the Ripper, side by side with the young James Kelly. That's amazing. Just so afraid it was going to be completely different. This could hit home run status. Now I feel better than ever about this guy. As we say in the police world, he looks good. And I think we may have actually put a face on Jack the Ripper.
With the evidence against Kelly mounting, Ed returns to the remarkable confession Kelly made at the end of...